When the Manhattan Project National Historic Park was established in three locations at Oak Ridge, Los Alamos, and Hanford, it established a new plane for interpretive complexity. The history of these three separate locations was very different. And at the Hanford unit, part of its history was underrepresented in the written record. Namely, the contribution of the contractor, the DuPont Company, whose foundational characteristics were so pivotal in the success of the Hanford Project, I mean of the Manhattan Project at Hanford. Guests that come out to B Reactor are well introduced into the what and why of the facilities out there. But the how and the who, we say very little about. How was Hanford built in such a short period of time? It's very difficult to understand the timeliness of Hanford unless the how and the who is added to the narrative. It's a fascinating story. The April 16th issue in 1951 of the Time magazine gives us a glimpse of how DuPont was looked upon after the Manhattan Project was completed. Their feature story was of the Wizards of Wilmington, the history of the DuPont Company, and started out telling about DuPont building the Savannah River Project, which was located to um, make materials for the hydrogen bomb. They had taken that project reluctantly. A generation before, they had been branded merchants of death when a committee from the US Congress had looked at uh, profit, uh, uh, profitation during World War I. And they would do anything to avoid that rebranding. But now, the government was saying DuPont was the only company that could build the Savannah River project. One expert in atomic energy said, to give that job to any other corporation when you could get DuPont would be like accepting a rookie when you had the opportunity to get Babe Ruth in the prime of his career. The story continued with events of nine years earlier and explained why DuPont was held in such high esteem. At that time, DuPont had taken on the construction of the plutonium manufacturing facilities at Hanford as part of the Manhattan Project. That was a far bigger project than the Savannah River Project. And it was probably the biggest contract ever let to one contracting agent in the history of our country. And it was also a much riskier project. So little was known about the materials and the processes involved. There was so much fear that we were behind the Germans in the development of the atomic bomb, and so much secrecy. But wait. This talk is not an infomercial for the DuPont Company. As a matter of fact, in our efforts to see whether we were, well, shall we say, exaggerating, we tried to get in touch with them. They don't want to even discuss the Manhattan Project. But the real reason for the talk is it's, an exp it's a reaction that while most of the popular histories of the Manhattan Project treat the contractor as a secondary citizen, only there in the service of their contracting agent. Those sources that looked at Hanford concluded things were very, very different at Hanford. There, probably there was no time in our history when we as a country were more dependent upon the performance of a single commercial identity. 
How was DuPont selected for that job? Well, a little history. In the fall of 1941, 42, I'm sorry, the Manhattan Project was established with the Corps of Engineers under the direction of uh, uh, Brigadier General Leslie Groves. The initial objective of this huge secret project was to produce the alternative um, ingredients for a bomb. First approach, separate out the scarce isotope, U-235, it was present only in less than 1%, from the rest of uranium. The second approach, produce an entirely new element that theoretically had the same characteristics as U-235. The intent was that both of these materials would be produced at Oak Ridge, Tennessee, because there was a vast amount of power in that location. And toward that end, some seven different corporations were under contract to build and produce uh, U-235 via two different approaches for isotope separation. But to make an entirely new element, now there was a job that was more like alchemy than chemistry. It involved the ingenious arrangement of natural uranium in what was called a pile, such that it would undergo a nuclear reaction and produce, yes, an entirely new element, plutonium, that had never existed on Earth. And um, we are not going to try to go into the details of that reaction, but we have to state one very important factor. It let loose a tremendous amount of heat. And you just, it, its safety was not adequate if you could not get rid of that heat. Remember the Chernobyl accident? Aha. Furthermore, plutonium was produced in very low concentrations within the uranium. One part in 4,000. So you had to dissolve all this uranium, put it through a lot of chemistry, and it had to be done totally remotely because by now the uranium was very radioactive. Very few micrograms of plutonium had ever been produced anywhere in the world. And so in March of 1942, an entirely new organization called the Metallurgical Lab, or the Met Lab, was set up at the University of Chicago. Some 2,000 scientists were studying all aspects of plutonium and its production. But as for the general, he was of the firm opinion that to take their data and make it into an industrial operation to produce kilograms of plutonium, there was only one corporation in the country that could do that, the DuPont Company. Why? Well, they were a relatively successful, well, very successful chemical company. Most of their materials came right out of their own research labs. They built their own plants, and they had a track record of being able to take grand ideas and commercialize them very rapidly. Think nylon. Also, they had a fixation on safety because they had a broad experience with explosives. The DuPont people couldn't be less interested in having anything to do with um, plutonium production. And they told the, ger uh, the general that, mainly because they were really scared of getting rebranded merchants of death. What they had heard from the general about how you produce plutonium had again convinced them that it, oh boy, it was a wild scheme with not too much chance of success. It really sounded more like something from a comic book than from a textbook. And lastly, because there was so much urgency to get in ahead of the Germans, the commercial operation was simply going to be a scale-up by a factor of one million or more of the experience in the Met Lab. That is, that is asking for trouble. Well, the general persisted saying the nation needed them, 
And finally, DuPont said, okay, we'll take it on, but we've got some conditions. And their conditions made that contract vastly different from what those other ones at Oak Ridge were. First, they would be totally responsible for the production of plutonium. Yeah, they would get from the metallurgical lab all of the parameters for this wonderful pile. But what got designed and built would be a DuPont decision. Furthermore, attached to the contract would be what they called a memorandum of understanding. And this one was a document signed by all parties that said, this is what we know about producing plutonium, and this is what we don't know. And this is the risk of trying to do it in one step. You shouldn't do it. Thirdly, the president had to ask them to do it. And their profit from this would be one dollar. Now, of course, they get paid for all of the activities, but their profit was one dollar. Fourth, there would not be <clears throat> it would not be built at Oak Ridge. And so consequently, eventually, well, the decision for that was it just wasn't safe. They didn't know enough about the safety of that step. So eventually, it was built at Hanford. Of course, it was important that the proximity of the Columbia River and of the um, uh, electricity that was available from the Grand Coulee Dam was very important. But the contract was basically a turnkey from soup to nuts and involved enlisting some 120,000 people to come to work in this vast wilderness, so to speak, of Hanford and to produce a place for 45,000 of them to live temporarily and also to build a city of 15,000 for those who would operate the plant. Well, all of this doesn't respond to the question, how did they do it? How did DuPont turn this barren desert into a giant industrial complex in less than 20 months? Well, of course, there was the national situation, the concern over survival. Then there was the organization of the Manhattan Project with the uh, single point of contact, with an open checkbook, highest priority, and an iron-fisted boss. But far more important were the foundational characteristics of DuPont. Many of these had been developed over the years and later were accepted during the um, next 20 years within the overall construction industry. But when, as practiced by DuPont, these were something that were almost part of their DNA rather than something they learned from a textbook. And so I would suggest that you go to the bereactor.org and click on Lost in the Telling for the details. But I'll hit on four of these. One is their propensity for characterizing I mean, visualizing and organizing the whole project into a series of small tasks, thousands of them, with known input and output, et cetera. And this allowed them to compress the schedule for design and construction far beyond what was normally assumed to be a safe, ske a safe schedule for a wartime emergency situation. Comparing the two, DuPont versus wartime emergency, the wartime emergency said that it should have taken two and a half years longer. Part of their experience also told them each one of these tasks has to be such that they can instruct the worker, which meant a tremendous amount of, of um, writing of organizational uh, skills as to what was required. And this they did, um, for example, at the B-reactor, some 3,000 pages 
of procedures were written before a spade of earth was even turned at building the reactor itself. Then they prioritized their uncertainties and, improve, and increased the conservatism of the design where they knew less about the subject. The most famous is depicted in this slide where DuPont insisted on 30% more of the tubes within this pile. The physicist said, ridiculous. As it turned out, absolutely necessary. And saved some 10 months of getting plutonium down to um, Los Alamos. Anybody want to predict what would have happened if we had 10 more months of World War II? No. And lastly, their being completely uh, focused on safety, asking themselves, what if, what if, what if? And as a result, they had absolutely no problems with the cooling. Contrast that to Fukushima and, and, and Chernobyl, where much more experienced designers didn't ask the right what-if questions. Well, moving on. Why is it that if DuPont was so highly regarded right after the Manhattan Project, that so little is written about it in the histories? Well, there's two ex explanations that are closely related. One is that historians look for good uh, sources if there's been a time delay between the events and the writing of the history. They love diaries. There were no diaries allowed at DuPont. Furthermore, the contribution there was basically for a devotion to details, details, and the very uh, substantive application of these details produce no diaries and not very interesting reading, particularly when you compare it to the mini biographies of the scientists. The second reason is there was tension between the scientists at the Met Lab and the engineers. The former thought DuPont had stolen their project. And so when they were approached with what happened at DuPont, think where the emphasis was. As a matter of fact, Crawford Greenwald, who was the director of the DuPont effort, said that uh, he later became president of the co company, said that in his opinion, Hanford was the, the best multidisciplinary co uh, project that had ever been raised. But unfortunately, the, sci uh, the physicists like to pull all the covers over onto their side of the bed. Well, what is the takeaway from this very brief narrative? One is, we'll never see anything like it again. But it is very important that we remember what was accomplished through the DuPont effort there. Because you can't understand what the full impact was of of the success at Hanford without that how and the who story. And there's also something for you. Come visit us out at B Reactor and ask about the how and the who story. And it may become a very key factor to improving Hanford's position in that critical category of encouraging visitors to come out to B Reactor because they have developed a fascination for Hanford. It sure has worked with me. Thank you. <laughs>